Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And as we often have to do, we have to report on the death of the oldest living American in the United States, Alilia Murphy, who died recently at the age of 114. Here is Inside Edition reporting on her 114th birthday party about four months ago. A song by Stevie Wonder, White Lace Gloves, and a crown fit for a queen. Alalia Murphy has now celebrated her birthday 114 times, reportedly making her the oldest woman in the United States. He said, God, he's the one that let her stay here too long. And it did not go unnoticed. New York State Senator Brian Benjamin declared July 6th Alalia Murphy Day in Harlem. She's still here, she's still strong, and she holds our family together. Alalia was born in North Carolina in 1905 when President Teddy Roosevelt was in his second term. The average worker made about 22 cents an hour, and only 8% of homes had a telephone. She moved to New York City 20 years later during the Harlem Renaissance. She was part of the movement of African Americans to Harlem. After her husband died young, Alalia raised her two daughters by herself, all while working as a seamstress and a salesperson. Ms. Murphy's key to such longevity, everything in moderation, and this motto. She says, no time to sleep, you sleep when you're dead. I think our oldest living American right now is also 114, Hester Ford, who's living in North Carolina. Well, as a way of introducing our feature tonight, we're going to do a little obit symmetry. This is critic Clive James, who we talked about last week introducing tonight's subject. And now it's time to meet our studio guest. He's a man of such wide interests that anything he isn't interested in isn't interesting. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one of the wider ranging intellects of the age, Jonathan Miller. Jonathan Miller died recently at the age of 85. He was one of the most brilliant people in the world. I knew him from Beyond the Fringe, the groundbreaking early 60s comedy review that he did with Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, and Alan Bennett. But he went on to have a long and distinguished career in many areas, and here is Matthew Bannister of the BBC Four last word on Jonathan Miller. Sir Jonathan Miller hated to be called a polymath, but undoubtedly was one. He was a celebrated theatre and opera director, a great communicator and conversationalist, and also a qualified doctor. His formidable intellect could be a bit of a trial for his son, William. My father would take us around art galleries. My friends would have given their right arm to have had those lectures in art galleries. I wanted to kill him. Because of his ability to communicate complex ideas to a wide audience and his skill as an entertainer, Jonathan Miller was in great demand on TV and radio programs. Here he is explaining his visceral reaction to this piece of music. I was first introduced to this by some school friend of mine at the age of about 15 who had a magnificent gramophone deck. Hot flush, cold shivers, bowel movements. That opening music of the Tchaikovsky First Piano Concerto still produces the effect in me that it did, I suppose, nearly 40 years ago. Jonathan Miller's grandparents were Jewish immigrants to the UK from Eastern Europe. His paternal grandfather settled in the East End, struggling at first to scrape a living as a hat maker. But, as his biographer Kate Bassett explains, Jonathan's parents made the leap into the middle class. His father went to Cambridge and became an absolutely leading child psychologist. And his mum, Betty Miller, was a sort of Bloomsbury novelist. So in his parents was this split between the science and the arts, which his whole life was about, really. So it's sort of fascinating. But I, I was just ill at ease and anxious and fearful at school, going to new schools all the time. Also, you must remember that boys' schools, prep schools in those days, were establishments filled with nasty, sadistic Christian masters who beat boys and got sexual kicks out of doing it. His childhood in itself is sort of amazing. So he was a fantastic little um, impersonator and he was obsessed with Danny Kay and actually got into Danny Kay's dressing room and did an imitation of Danny Kay in front of him. Danny Kay said, oh, what do you want to do? And in this brilliant sort of predicted his whole life, he... Miller said, I want to be a doctor, and Danny Kay said, you'll never do it. Because <laughs> <You kind of laughs> that was the dichotomy so of the whole thing, wasn't it? Because yeah. he, he moved between the theatre world and medicine yeah. the whole time. Yeah, so he trained as a doctor following in his father's footsteps and would have probably been a really brilliant um, neuropsychologist or medic of some sort, but jumped when Beyond the Fringe happened. I wonder how many of these people have realised that Jonathan Miller's a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> 
I suppose he gets away with it because of his ginger hair, actually. <laughs> I'd rather be working class than be a Jew. Oh, any day. <laughs> Think of the awful situation if you were working class and a Jew. <laughs> There's always somebody worse off than yourself. <laughs> In fact, I'm not really a Jew. Just Jewish, not the whole hog. You know. The impact of the time on British society was huge in that it was the start of the satire boom. And they were absolutely lionised. And lots of British comics who came up after them saw them. So Eric Idle, John Cleese saw him in Footlights. And, and I think it was life-changing for those people. One of the advantages of living in Great Court Trinity, I seem to recall, was the fact that one could pop across at any time of the day or night and trap the then young G.E. Moore into a logical falsehood by means of a cunning semantic subterfuge. <laughs> I recall one occasion with particular vividness. I had popped across and had knocked upon his door. Come in, he said. I decided to wait a while in order to test the validity of his proposition. <laughs> It was also a shift in society and that institutional figures, including the Prime Minister, were being satirised. So it was kind of revolutionary. But did he later regret having leapt into the, the world of performance and the world of the arts? Well, yes, he did, hugely. Though I think one could also at the same time take that with a pinch of salt in that he was a very conflicted, complex, rich personality. He was a very innovative theatre director. What are the productions that stand out? There are so many, but I would I would say one that people would remember, well, two maybe, um, Laurence Olivier in uh, The Merchant of Venice. So he was, what well, he was brilliant at updating things, but updating them so they really fitted. So he made Shylock into a sort of Victorian Jew who was very assimilated, looked like kind of Rothschild. And that worked brilliantly. I'd say another one was probably his Chekhov's Three Sisters. And and he was just, I think he had kind of East European roots. I think he got the humour stroke tragedy. We must talk about opera. Yes. And one of his famous productions, of course, is of the Mikado. And I don't think he was a great fan of Gilbert and Sullivan, but he, but he did wonders with that production, which is still revived now, isn't it? It is. He, he did the longest running productions that the ENO has ever had, and they're still going. <laughs> He had a deep dislike of Gilbert and Sullivan, as he was quoted as saying that, that Gilbert and Sullivan was uh, music for UKIP. <laughs> it's duck soup. It's the Marx Brothers duck soup. And he was a completely passionate fan of the Marx Brothers. There's a moment when Groucho gets summoned and comes down to the meeting in duck soup. <laughs> And I make the entrance of the Mikado exactly like that. I base it entirely on what happened in Duck Soup. And then on the other track, he made a, a wonderful television series called The Body in Question. Yes, that was amazing. All, all about the, the way our bodies work. <laughs> yeah, and it was the history of medicine. I think what was, again, great about that was... His polymathic nature meant that he could draw brilliant analogies so that he could always explain something with an analogy and so you'd get it. And so whilst being incredibly bright and well-read, he was actually a great popularizer. I'm going to go in through the aorta and so I shall approach this in the opposite direction to the way in which the blood would be flowing in life. I'm going to cut into the aorta now. To a certain extent, family holidays were purgatory for him, but he did come on them. Um, he had a tendency um, when we were driving back from the beach or from a long walk somewhere that any sight of a, of a dead rodent on the road um, would, would force him to stop the car, peel it off the, the tarmac and return it to the kitchen where he'd nail it to a breadboard and then, and then dissect it and, and show us the anatomy of, of, of any mammal that he'd managed to find. You must have spent hours sitting with him and talking when you were writing your biography. What was it like to sit with such a famous conversationalist? Slightly nerve-wracking, not on a, on a very low level, because you're thinking, I am going to say something incredibly stupid at some point and reveal my massive ignorance. The first time I met him, he was he kind of sprawled on a sofa like an adolescent, though he was 60 years old. He had a very loose limbs. So he was very relaxed. So you watch him on, you know, Parkinson and things. He's sort of half laying back in the chair with his arms behind his head. And so I think that's actually rather charming that it was like you were talking to someone in their sitting room all the time, even when he was on TV shows, uh, which I suspect was part of his popular appeal. I got the sense that later in his life he felt 
rather bitter about the way he was treated in England and, and that he, he felt the critics were harsh to him, that the industry had turned its back on him and he went abroad and, and, and found a better reception for his talents abroad. Was he embittered towards the end of his life? Yes, he was. Uh, I mean, you could if you got him on a bad day, it was sort of on a loop tape. He was, I would say, a mildly depressive person and possibly... I think, suffered when he wasn't working. So, you know, working in the theatre is sporadic. You direct something, there's a gap, you direct something. And I think he, he struggled with that. And would you you'd sort of go around and he looked cadaverous and unshaven. And then when he was directing, it was almost like a sort of lifeblood thing and the, the vitality would come back. But he was bitter and he could be very scorning. On a good day, would recognise that about himself occasionally and regret it and the the other very sweet thing is his his wife and kids he, he absolutely adored his family and was was very much a home bird when he wasn't working and they would take the mickey out of him they would sort of tell him to stop and tell him off and he would look a bit humiliated but then sort of go fair enough my father absolutely loathed any kind of title for who he was to give him the title of a polymath or renaissance man um sort of misunderstood what he was about and what he stood for you know my father was someone who was passionate about so many different things he really just sort of felt it needed to be left at that it didn't need you didn't need to um you know prize up the um the, lift the lid up and, and examine what was inside for me he was, he was like a kind of swiss army knife you know he could just do everything you know he could do art he could do music he could do directing he could do um, comedy you know but what other word for that is there than polymath Kate Bassett on Sir Jonathan Miller, who's died aged 85. You know, as they mentioned Footlights, the Cambridge theatrical troupe that he was part of, Clive James was part of, we mentioned that last week. Among the other notables in Footlights were Eric Idle, John Cleese, and David Frost. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and ITG, Sid Tapps. We're going to close tonight with the Arena Football League, which has died at the age of 32. The Indoor Football League was started in 1987, and it recently declared bankruptcy. According to NBC Sports, it lasted for more than 30 years. Now the Arena Football League is no more. The 50-yard indoor war on the floor, which first arrived in 1987, announced Wednesday that it will file for Chapter 7 bankruptcy, the bad kind, and cease to exist. We're all disappointed that we couldn't find a way forward, and we wanted to thank our fans, our players, coaches, everyone who loved the Arena Football League. AFL Commissioner Randall Bose said in a statement, we all love the game and tried very hard to make it successful, but we simply weren't able to raise the capital necessary to grow the league, resolve the substantial legacy liabilities, and make it financially viable. The league had suspended all local opportunities last month. It had been considering the possibility of continuing as a traveling league. The AFL survived plenty of struggles and iterations with expansion and contraction and a team owned by the founders of KISS and a bankruptcy that knocked out the 2009 season and most recently a six-team league. Well, the AFL played its modified version of American football on a 66 by 28 yard field, roughly a quarter of the NFL surface area. The rules were geared towards offense, resulting in pinball-like scores and plenty of passing, and many players played both offense and defense. The league was a collection of developing players, Old NFL players hoping for one last shot, and college players who simply loved the game. We had a pretty entertaining Arena League team here in Chicago, the Chicago Rush. They played for about 12 years in the early 2000s. They were coached by Mike Hohensee, who was the Bears' replacement quarterback during the strike in 1987. Ditka pulled him in to quarterback for a couple of games. Without question, the greatest player in AFL history was Kurt Warner, who played for the Iowa Barnstormers. He'd been cut by the Packers coming out of college in northern Iowa, and he was bagging groceries. He went to the Arena League, and he learned to throw quick, tight spirals in narrow windows. Mike Martz picked him up for the Rams, and he became the feature quarterback for the greatest show on turf, the great offense that the Rams had during the early 2000s. Warren was a great story. He was the MVP of Super Bowl 34 and ultimately became a Hall of Famer. As a final tribute to the Arena Football League, I think we'll play a great 1964 song by the Everly Brothers. The Arena Football League is gone, so we'll play Gone, Gone, Gone. Some sunny day, baby, when everything seems okay.